Hello, I'm Dr. Kathleen Schmidt from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Welcome to the Data Science Institute's virtual seminar series. With Lawrence Livermore being home to many challenging data sets, as well as some of the world's most advanced supercomputers, data science has become an essential discipline in the lab's key program areas. The DSI acts as a central hub for the lab's data science activities by fostering collaborations, promoting research, and engaging in outreach activities. Our DSI staff work in a variety of areas, including artificial intelligence, big data analytics, computer vision, machine learning, predictive modeling, statistical inference, and uncertainty quantification. The DSI hosts events like this seminar series to introduce new ideas and potential collaborators to the lab. We invite speakers from other institutions, both from the Bay Area and beyond, to share their innovative projects, approaches, and ideas with our data science community. We're pleased now to include a wider audience beyond the lab to engage with us through this series. You can read about past speakers on our website, data-science.llnl.gov, or email us at datascience.llnl.gov. Thank you, and enjoy the seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce Amanda Myskins, one of my fellow members of the Applied Stats Group. She has a PhD in statistics from North Carolina State. She joined the lab in 2019 as a postdoc and has since converted to staff. Her research interests include Gaussian processes, computationally efficient statistical methods, and uncertainty quantification. And today she'll be telling us about her scalable Gaussian process software. And I'll turn it over to Amanda. Thank you so much, Katie. And thank you all for being here. Um, before I start, I just want to address the elephant in the room since you're going to see me, uh, my, my sling, I, my shoulder. I, I had surgery when I was younger and recently it's been bothering me again. It might be dislocated or torn or something, but anyway, I hope it's not too much of a distraction. I just wanted to address that before I got further and everyone was wondering. Um, so I'm really excited what, uh, here to talk to you today about, uh, this this project that we've been working on as a part of the MADSTAIR LDRD strategic initiative here at LLNL. And there's a group of us that are very cross-disciplinary. So myself, I'm in the engineering uh, directorate, but I live in, like Katie said, in the applied statistics group. We have representation from CASC, including Ben Priest, um, and PLS, including my collaborators, Amen Gumiri and Michael Schneider. Um, so before we start, the, the, the name of this research uh, project and this method um, is called MyGPs. Uh, you say it like there's no U in it. Um, there's been lots of mispronunciation, which is fine. Um, but so the, the name actually in this little graphic here, it comes from the, the last names of uh, the, the inventors here of our group, myself, Amen, Ben, and Michael's last names. Um, it, it, wasn't a it was a happy accident that we had GPs since GPs is what we'll be talking about. Um, and we say here that it's for the space domain, uh, the problems that we focused on um, and what inspired this were from the space domain, but really it's a general use machine learning method that we're really excited about for the future. Okay. So anyone who's worked in AI or machine learning or even has data know that what's going on right now in the field of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, that uh, as in addition to data sets being larger and larger and more complex, uh, the, the computing resources that are needed for uh, optimal training of these new algorithms is increasing as time is going on and it's estimated that you know this computing resource need is doubled approximately every three to four months and with larger and larger data sets more problems we'd like to uh, uh, apply these to this is just such an unsustainable rate now there are really two main approaches that one could take in order to fix this problem and one is to look at those those uh, viable machine learning methods like deep neural networks and make some fundamental changes to them to, to make them more computationally efficient or build architectures, um, hardware that will fit them, um, 
better. Um, so that's one method, but this the type of method that we are leaning towards is to look in the other class of models that exist and try and see if we can come up with a model that could be competitive with these deep learning models with big data and potentially do some tweaking that could scale them and so that they could move past and become even more scalable. And so that's what we're we're going to do here. And the type of method that we're going to focus on is called a Gaussian process. Um, so basically, this is thought of as a machine learning model. The machine learning community has really adopted it. But for, for, my, for my money, it's really a statistical method. Um, and basically, at its core, what a Gaussian process is, is you have data, it's across some domain, and you assume any data that you were to draw from that domain follows a multivariate normal random, uh, a, a random multivariate normal distribution. So meaning that it is the, the distribution of that data is fully specified with some mean mu and some covariance K here, we're gonna call it. And that K is gonna be guided by some parameters theta that we'll have to estimate. And so the general idea of this problem is that you'll have data at fixed locations across the domain. Um, and you'll want to interpolate basically that data. And uh, what's unique about Gaussian processes is unlike other machine learning methods, why I deem it a statistical method, is because it's got this normal distribution uh, assumption, you can actually derive exactly through conditional distributions what the, the uncertainties are of your estimation. So instead of just getting in this, this example, this was a temperature data that was collected at certain uh, sites across the US, we don't only get the, uh, the estimate of that temperature, but we also get the uncertainty of how far we think we are off. Um, the other thing that Gaussian process models are known for being uh, doing really well is they're very robust in very small data sets. So if you don't have super large data, this would be a really, really good choice um, because they tend to outperform because they have this extra structure of this model that you're assuming. As opposed to something like a neural network or a step model or something like that that needs tons of data. Okay, so let's dig into a little bit into the math of what that assumption means and what those distributions are for our predictions. Okay, so we're going to assume that we observe some Y data vector. And so in that previous example, it was the temperature was the Y and the X locations were the lats and longs of where those points were. And let's say we want to predict at a single location Z. So our prior, if you will, if you're a Bayesian, um, uh, uh, the, the first assumption we make is that everything is uh, jointly normal because we assume it's a Gaussian process. So basically that means our, our predicted location given our location is also going to be multivariate normal with this mean and this covariance, okay. So those are sort of abstract functions, but you can see that they're based on that covariance matrix. And particularly what I want you to focus on is right here. So this set of matrices. So the first matrix, if Z is only one prediction location, um, this is a one by N matrix multiplied by an N by N matrix, essentially, where N is the number of observations in your training data. Um, so, so this comes out, the matrix vector multiplication comes out to be a vector, a one by N vector that you then apply to your Y's, which is your training data. So basically this can be thought of as just a weighted regression. It's a weighted average really. So um, even though Gaussian processes seem very abstract and Krieging is the word that we use to describe this process, it's really quite accessible. Um, and I just want it noted that although people like to focus on the multivariate normal distribution a lot, uh, but this mean prediction is actually the best linear unbiased predictor, even when that normality assumption does not hold. Uh, that might not mean anything to you, but it, it's meaning it's the best estimator we can come up with uh, if, if it's a general distribution. Modest, modest assumptions. Okay, so that K matrix is guided by some covariance with parameters theta. Um, and very often that's chosen to be 
uh, something like a radial basis function squared exponential. The, the, uh, the form that I prefer and the form that really tends to work the best in these types of data is called the Maturin covariance. And uh, I want it noted that uh, as one of these parameters, which is this new parameter, approaches infinity, this becomes exactly the radial basis function uh, form that you're used to seeing. Um, so it's a lot more complicated. Like you, you can see, it includes Bessel functions. Um, so it has in its form that I'm showing right here four parameters. The first, which is sigma squared, is called the scale parameter. The next row is called the, the length scale parameter. The next is called the smoothness parameter. And the final one, that tau squared, is called the nugget or the measurement error. Um, and very often, these parameters together are difficult to estimate. There's identifiability problems, but particularly between new and row. And in practice, Lots of times people will just fix the smoothness. You might have seen like uh, a matern smoothness three halves or a matern smoothness one half. And the reason that they do that is because this Bessel function disappears. Okay, so, so that's fine, but actually we've done a lot of sensitivity and identifiability analysis on this. And we found that for those creaking weights to change based on this value, actually you want to let new vary. So this is actually the opposite of what uh, is done currently in, um, in SKLearn. So, so you have to be really careful. It will not do this correctly for you. Okay, so if you can only estimate one parameter, that's the one you want to estimate. But to estimate uh, the variance, you will need more of them, particularly that scale parameter, since here uh, the, the scale parameter uh, it, uh, basically linearly scales. I don't have it written there very well. Okay, so typically what one would do is given you have that form for your covariance matrix, you would throw your data and, and that form into the multivariate normal likelihood, and you'd like to maximize your likelihood so you can estimate your parameters. Um, that is very rarely possible in current data, and the reason is this K matrix. Okay, so K itself is N by N, so number of training observations by number of training observations. So the best way usually to estimate this likelihood itself is to do a Kolesky decomposition of that K matrix. Uh, that operation in terms of flops is order N cubed, uh, which is extremely slow. Not only that, but that involves actually forming that matrix, which uh, forming it itself, obviously it has n squared operate, uh, elements. Um, so the, that becomes impossible. Now, even if I just want to look at the predictions, let's say forget about the likelihood, I just want to do predictions, this itself still has the identically same problems where we have to form and invert uh, a matrix of science n squared. Um, basically, this becomes impossible, at least in R, uh, on general machinery laptop, this starts to become impossible after about 10,000 observations, which I'm sure you know is very, very small for most, uh, most modern applications. And uh, so these Gaussian processes sort of have gotten thrown out the window because of this, because they're just not reasonable for normal problems. And there's not even a really a good way to uh, to my knowledge, there's not an HPC implementation of a typical Gaussian process like this, just because it's not really easily parallelizable in any way, shape, or form. The predictions are, but the, uh, the actual inversion of that matrix isn't. Okay, so I share this with my machine learning colleagues, and the first question as I get is, well, you have too many points, why don't you just batch it? Why don't you just select some of those points, fit them in the likelihood, and repeat? Now, traditional batching, and this is in the most naive sense of how one might apply this to this problem. Clearly, this is the first thing people tried back when this problem was starting to be addressed. Uh, but there are two problems here because there are two sort of ways you might go about this batching. Now, the first way is you might think, okay, I'll down select to only points across the domain, only some of them. Um, and the problem with this is that you're, instead of your data points that you originally had that were extremely dense, you're making your new observations very, very spread apart. 
um, that will mean that you can't actually uh, estimate those very small differences in things that are close together, which actually it has been shown these are high frequency trends are the most important in order to get your predictions correctly. So, so your uh, observation, your estimation will extremely suffer in this case, you won't get anywhere near the true MLE. So another way to, to deal with this and say, okay, so I can't put them out all over the domain. I can put them in one small block. Um, so this is a better approach. You're getting closer because uh, at least you're you'll be able to uh, estimate those high frequencies. Um, but the problem is that when data is very close together in this problem, they're highly correlated. So when things are highly correlated, the estimates you're going to get of them are wildly varying compared to what you'd get when they're nearly independent. Like if you're trying to take a mean of things that are all correlated, you're going you could potentially be extremely biased. Um, another reason this is a problem is that if you've only taken, so we've used the same amount of points on the left and the right, but yet the, the right looks like uh, only one tiny small part of this big picture. Um, so if, if the, the covariance at all changes, those data parameters change across your domain, you're not even going to get close in the ballpark if you've only taken one small domain. Okay, so this, this is the problem with the typical way of going about this. We're going to reinvent batching for this problem in a new way that uh, combines these methods a little bit, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, so let's talk about what our algorithm is. Um, and I want to talk about first uh, sort of these three pillars that describe that make this, this method work. So the first is unlike methods you might be familiar with, like uh, methods for this, like uh, Bobby Gramercy's LAGP, or like moving window methods, things more generally, where you've just taken a local model. Um, so instead of doing something like that, uh, because we have a global model, we're still uh, assuming our Gaussian process, that same covariance, we're just going to make approximations and how do we estimate that? We've not lost that model at all. So that means that our uncertainty quantification is still going to be totally valid and we're going to be able to infer uh, how, how far we're off and quantify that well by these conditional distributions. Okay, so the second thing that we're, the second pillar of my GPs is that um, we're going to, instead of trying to estimate or even approximate that expensive likelihood function, we're going to take a more machine learning based approach and we're just going to optimize that function based on some sort of prediction loss or some of some other objective function. But the point being, we're never going to evaluate that likelihood. Um, the other point, part I want to make very clear here is we are not doing a grid search. Usually when people think of cross-validation, uh, they, they automatically associate it with a grid search because you've left some out and you test it for all your parameters. We, we're not actually doing that. We're actually optimizing that cross-validation. Okay, so at this point, you're, you're thinking, well, what you've done actually here is more expensive than what you started out with and you would be completely correct. So these predictions, like I said, um, each prediction that we're going to make here based on that, that Kriging weights equation is going to be on the order of um, ON cubed, like we said, and we're gonna do N of them. So that's ON uh, to the fourth power, which is even worse, but here's where the approximation comes in. Um, and so we're gonna assume instead of doing, uh, instead of implying a vector that's of length n to the data, we're gonna, we're gonna sparsify that Kriging weights vector so that we're only going to let the, the variables of the closest uh, points, the nearest neighbors to that point, be non-zero. And this is actually going to be a much better approximation than uh, other local model assumptions that do this to the correlation structure itself. So things like LAGP, where they're completely cutting off the data um, and, and just, as, just fitting data using a multivariate normal within a certain domain. So that is worse. The Kriging weights are essentially themselves even more sparse. So generally here on the left, 
the picture that I'm trying to predict at that starred location, I would have some sort of vector that was applied to the entire data set. Instead, I'm going to do something more like on the right. And so this is going to be uh, a bunch of parallelizable little operations of small solves. I'm basically exchanging one very large solve for a bunch of small ones, which computing can do. Uh, and we're excited because these ha have worked very well. Okay, so I'm going to talk about just the details of that, um, just a few of the, the, the mathematical details for those of you who are more mathematically minded about this algorithm. Okay, so our locations, so our lat longs, if you will, of the data uh, are going to be these X's and they're normalized between zero and one. Now, I think this is generally good hygienic Gaussian process practice to begin with, but also uh, particularly to use our software, it is assuming that the data will be in this range. Okay, so uh, for each observation, so each xi, let's just say x sub ni is going to be those uh, that have its nearest neighbor set. Okay, so basically what this is doing is it, the prediction is just going to be some small vector times the data instead that's based on those closest nearest neighbors. So we formulate this then into this optimization problem, and I promised you that the batching would come back. Um, so instead of doing this for all of the observations in the training locations, we're going to do this for a subset of the training locations across the, the domain. Now, this is this corrects those batching problems that we talked about before, um, because for each problem, we're going to always, for each point that we batch, we're still going to include all of its neighbors. So we're never going to think artificially distant. And since we're going to take these across the domain, we're going to be averaging um, basic, as independent of things as we can get. And we're going to be uh, seeing the process of the entire domain. So batching it like this is not at all harmful. And actually, we found it extremely beneficial and not really worth it to, to fit the entire data set. Okay, so just one last visual example of this, since, since this is our main idea, I hope this is the one thing you all take away. So this is our temperature data. We're trying to predict uh, at these locations. These are, our, our, I'm sorry, these are the, da uh, the batched data locations. Um, we're trying to predict at the, the, the white left out locations. Um, and so for each of these batch locations, we take the nearest neighbors. Now these are a little bit more square but in reality, the nearest neighbors would be a little bit more rounded on the end. This is just a image approximation. And so for each of these starred locations, we would use the highlighted data approximately to, to uh, get the prediction at the starred location. And then we'd average across those and we'd optimize the mean squared error between the truth and the predicted star locations. Okay, so now you're asking, okay, those seem like fine things, but what you're telling me is just that those approximations work. What, if, what happens when you may change the size of your nearest neighbor sets? What happens when you batch differently? I want to talk about those two questions just really quickly here before we move into some examples. Um, so local Kriegian actually has been a tool in the back pocket of uh, spatial statisticians that people silently have been using for years. Um, uh, they, they'll fit the entire maximum likelihood estimation a problem correctly, and then they'll just throw local Kriegian in the end because it doesn't matter very much. And this was the explanation I was given by some professors I had, and uh, I always thought that this was very strange, but actually it does not actually make that big of a difference, which is why we're ever able to leverage this. Um, so basically here I'm showing you for some very small neighborhood sizes, so relative to a data size of approximately 10,000. Uh, this is the root mean squared error of the, the, the error between the full prediction and the prediction using only those nearest neighbors. Now, each time I've generated data from a return and I'm randomly generating it from either a smooth or non-smooth process. And so clearly, the smoother the process is, the further you need data away uh, will depend on the data. Uh, that you're trying to predict. So this will vary. And just to, 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 to take a snapshot, I just averaged over uh, looking at those. 
Um, and so basically we see the, the black line here is the mean. Um, and so although, and the, the regions are 95% uh, empirical confidence intervals at each of these um, simulation settings. Um, and so for very, very small nearest neighbor sets, there's quite a large, uh, well, a, a 0 0.02 RMSE, and these are normalized RMSEs. So that's on the order of something between, it could be between negative three and three approximately. That's the, the data output. So this 2% is still, it's less than 2%, very, very small in that term. Um, but but basically, we uh, the mean at about 200 neighbors hood size is about zero, although there are some cases that tend to be a little higher than that, but really nothing more than 0 0.01. Um, and in terms of computing time, we're starting to see this quadratic trend exactly what you'd expect. Um, and so basically, uh, what we can assume from this and what we can see from this is basically anything 50 or higher nearest neighbors, and clearly the larger the nearest neighbors that you can do, uh, the better your approximation is going to be. But of course, it will be a trade-off in time. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about is how batching will uh, affect this surface that you're optimizing. So the surface, this uh, mean squared error is a nice convex function, which is nice because it is not the case uh, that the, the multivariate normal is always nice and convex to optimize. Um, but but uh, sometimes there can be problems if your batching is too small. Uh, so basically, what I'm showing here is for a simulation, again, of about uh, 10,000 uh, points, I'm sampling, uh, each of these lines represents one batched sample of however many that I'm showing there, and I'm showing repeated observations of that. Um, and so by the time I've reached about 50, or not 50, I'm sorry, 500, or even up to 2,000, you can, oh, definitely at 2,000, you can almost not tell the difference between these surfaces that I'm optimizing. And note, even at 500, although uh, the, the lines don't appear to be identically the same, you can definitely see that the minimums all hit at the same place. And that is the important part, since we want them to optimize the same. Okay, so I have had people come back to me with, with the software that I'm going to teach you how to use and note that their, their parameter estimations sometimes flip between too, way too smooth and not too smooth. Basically what this information is telling me here is that means that your batch size is not big enough. So you see some of these in like the lower batch sizes where you see even at zero uh, for uh, like most of the values, that's basically what this is telling you. So it may act artificially tell you to sample something too smooth. So if you're getting wildly varying answers when you're fitting our, our thing, you might consider raising your batch size and that might help. Okay, so the last question here is when does my GPs have advantage over regular computing? Um, in what sample sizes, in what neighborhood sizes, and what batch sizes. So I'm just going to show you a few examples. This is a really complex problem. Clearly, this is a high dimensional problem that you could figure it all out. Um, so I'm showing you in a 1D dimensional case. So this is like a time series data. So traditionally, the scaling would be, and this is all theoretical, the, the scaling would be um, on the order of n cubed flops. Um, ours would be on the order of batch size times log n, which uh, this first term is for uh, getting the nearest neighbors, and the second term is for inverting the matrix. Um, and here m is the neighborhood size. So in a large neighbor, a larger neighborhood of about 100 neighbors, um, uh, so basically here I'm fitting the batch size, no batch size, I'm letting the batch size be the largest that it will be. Um, just over 1,000 training sa samples, um, we see advantage, uh, theoretical advantage of my GPs. Um, additionally, in a much smaller neighborhood size, we see a much uh, sooner advantage in my GPs of around 350. Um, uh, so I honestly, I wouldn't give anyone the advice to fit this if your data size was less than 1,000 anyway, since strange things can happen in our software with very small sample sizes. 
Um, so if anything larger than a thousand, it starts to be a theoretical advantage here. Okay, so one more thing, just because I want to show you how well we do uh, in in these larger, more realistic data training sizes. So those seemed really close, and like maybe those weren't too large of samples to talk about. Um, so uh, we do offer a, a much bigger advantage, particularly um, in the larger your training size goes. So here in, a, in an N equals 10,000 case, which is just the edge of what you could theoretically compute uh, with normal methods, uh, you would have to fit a neighborhood size less than 800 for MyGPies to have a training size or uh, an advantage. And something similar in a million, you would have to have a huge neighborhood size. So these are much larger than you would fit in practice. So theoretically, I would deem at both these uh, sample sizes for any any reasonable neighborhood size that one might actually fit, you're going to see a theoretical advantage in fitting my GPIs. Okay, so what I've talked about thus far has all been regression problems. Now, another main machine learning problem, something like where you're trying to identify the classification MNIST, for example, the handwriting recognition, you're, it's a classification problem. Um, and so that is not so obviously a Gaussian process like temperature or something we've talked about previously, but MyGPI still fits things like this. And so the way that we do this is that uh, instead of having it directly on the data, assuming that the, let's say we've encoded things to be negative one and one of our two classes, um, we assume then that our Gaussian, we have some underlying Gaussian process, which I'm going to call F. Our data is still going to be Y, and it's going to either be that negative or positive, but F is going to guide whether Y is positive or negative. Um, and so generally, we're just going to threshold this value. So we're going to get a prediction in this latent space, and then whether it's above or below zero, we're going to call it one class or the other. And it's going to fit very similarly to the regression case, other than this latent part of the model. Um, the one thing I want to point out here is that the way that the software works right now, it assumes that you have both equally sized training data for both, uh, and that the world is is evenly spread. So given no information, I wouldn't know which classification it would come from, not that it's unbalanced, that one is more reasonable than the other. And so you might have to change this mean assumption, and we don't have functionality for this quite yet, but I would just be aware of this if you're trying to fit this kind of data. Okay, so basically one example of how this works, uh, the, here's a 1D example where class two is the, the dots at the bottom, class one is the triangles at the top, and the, the dotted or the black lines here are our predicted values for all these X values using the Gaussian process, the latent Gaussian process. So the smoother your, your answers are, the, the more towards the center it tends to be since you're smoothing over more of them. And so anything that comes up as being above the zero line will be determined to be class one and anything below will be class two. Okay, the hyperbam parameter training, I'm going to skip this because it's very much the same. The only difference here is that uh, instead of doing this uh, prediction um, step the way that we did it before, where we're trying to predict uh, the mean squared error, we're going to use some other function. And the criterion we've used here is called the log loss or the cross entropy loss. It's very common in machine learning, but one could use uh, other criterion, of course. Okay, so what's unique about the Gaussian processes is that we can get uncertainty quantification on the latent values. Now, it's not exactly clear without uh, further explanation what uncertainty in a class explanation means. There are lots of definitions of this you can see in the literature. And so, so I, when I started to think about this problem, I started to think about what we needed. So let's say that you, you have something that's automated, that's uh, determining what class things go in class one or class two, and you have limited resources to recheck some of these by hand. Now, you don't wanna just randomly recheck them because likely if your classifier is good, those things will be correct, but you'd like to know which ones your classifier thinks 
are the least uh, accurate ones. Um, and that's that's the sort of approach we took here to uncertainty. Um, and so basically the idea is to identify an ambiguous category that the, the um, that the classifier will give you. So it'll give you class one, class two, and ambiguous, which means that the, the latent prediction is non-significantly different than your cutoff, which on this picture here on the left, it's similar to the picture we saw earlier, except now we're also seeing the uncertainties around them. And so these latent uncertainties, if they overlap with that horizontal cutoff line, that means that that would be classified as ambiguous. Now, where this comes from is from statistical testing of whether that that uh, uh, that prediction point is significantly different from zero, your cutoff or not. Um, and so, basically, if you'd there, there are two types of errors that one could make in this. Either you could have the correct classification and you could deem it ambiguous, and uh, that would what be what we call a type two error. Or you could uh, you could be wrong and it could be unambiguous, and that would be what we call a type one error. And so sometimes uh, what what uh, so I have this theory in my head that sometimes you'd want to balance this that um, sometimes missing something is worse than not than not flagging it. You rather go through a bunch of them than have one bad apple and you're sure, certain uh, fail. Um, and so you can balance different values of how you value these two errors within your own specific application. Um, and so theoretically, one would want to optimize some function of these two errors that you could make. And by optimizing these functions, you can train that scale parameter. Now, I haven't talked about it yet, but actually you can't estimate the scale parameter via MyGPies because in the predictions, it basically cancels. Um, so you can only do this with uncertainty information. So this is sort of a unique and uh, almost ad hoc way to train this parameter, but it's very useful for this application. Um, and you, one doesn't have to do this. This is just one view of uncertainty in the model. I do want to show you we have other views of uncertainty that people have used with the model, uh, meaning uh, this is just for a specific data set. So I wouldn't be too concerned with what the exact values are. Um, but the idea being if the model thinks that it's about 60% uh, sure that this is class one, that 60% of the time it should be. Um, and that 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 tends to be true. Um, my two pies does a really good job of that, particularly for for low values, and it's a little conservative in high values, which I think honestly, personally, is the better way to be. Um, uh, you will notice it has this gives us hope. It has this sort of uh, uh, antagonistic uh, relationship with what we fit of a neural network, and we're still trying to unpack this. But what we can infer from this is potentially in the future, some sort of hybrid method might be the best kind of method uh, for these. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about some data examples and show you how this works actually in practice. Okay, so the first data set, I've shown you this picture a dozen times. You're probably sick of it, but it's actually my favorite uh, example of this in the literature. It's a really good Gaussian process benchmark. So the full data here is about 150,000 points, which is much, much larger than anything you can fit with a typical data set, or a typical GP. Um, and the training data is on the order of 100,000. So this is land surface temperature data that was collected from the MODIS satellite for, for August 4th, 2016. And actually what the, the original pe people who wrote this paper who originally dealt with this data did is they took cloud cover from a similar day and applied it to the testing data. So you would have realistic missing patterns so that you have this large chunk missing as opposed to missing at random, which would be a much, much easier prediction problem. Um, so generally the idea of this paper was that they took every uh, important approximate Gaussian process method that existed at the time, which this was 2019, um, and they, they pitted them against each other and they had the original inventors of each of these types of, uh, 
each of these methods uh, fit their own method. So there was possibly no misuse of any method or misunderstanding. So we could get the best estimation from all of them. Okay, and so this is a, uh, a summary of that. Um, and so we've added our MyGPies to this plot. They didn't include this plot, but, but clearly um, the, the top, the y-axis here is the root mean squared error. And so lower is better, better accuracy is better. Um, and it, the x-axis is computing time where we want to be more towards the left. Um, because, and I want to note it as well that this, this axis is in the log scale. So going towards the right, you get bad very, very quickly. Um, so we've added some of our MyGPies to this, uh, uh, some of our own results, and we've added this for several nearest neighbor sets. So the more nearest neighbor sets you have, the more accurate we are. And clearly with 200 nearest neighbor sets, we're the most accurate um, method. Um, but also with uh, less nearest neighbor sets, we are still in the... Uh, in the top one or two. So if you consider the second point is 50, we're, we're in the top two, but we've by far exceeded the, the uh, timing that these other methods have. Okay, and so uh, this is just the same data looking at it directly. You can see this direct time and accuracy trade-off. Now we could have kept going in terms of near savers, but it would have just resulted we, since we had already uh, deemed ourselves the, the best, um, the most accurate method, it wasn't worth it to keep going, but we were are seeing this accuracy increase. Um, now in terms of batch size, uh, even with extremely small batch size of about uh, 25 here, we're only seeing a 12, 12,000 difference in the root mean squared error in, in re repetition of this. So basically even small, small batch sizes work on this. But uh, as you can see at 2000 here, our magic number, there is absolutely no variance in that prediction accuracy. Okay, so this is a little overwhelming. The, I just wanted to show you the actual results of all the, the variables they com, um, compared in their um, their method. The reason being that it's not just enough to get the predictions correct. We have to also get the uncertainties correct, right? That's a very big part of this problem and the big reason we'd want to use a Gaussian process. So what I want you to focus on is this value here. So I've used three mean functions. It's not important. So instead of assuming a zero mean Gaussian process, I assumed either a uh, constant, uh, a linear mean, or this is a, a fancier moving window type Gaussian filtering mean. All of these are very easy. You would just take this out prior to fitting in your data in MyGPies. Um, but uh, so for various values here, this, this for this value in particular, we see we have the fastest computing time. Uh, of, uh, I guess I haven't told you, these bottom sections here are, are the original paper and a follow-up paper that people have published. So this is uh, a full comparison of our methods all at the top and previous methods all at the bottom. Um, so we have the fastest computing time, about 45 seconds to fit something that's not even possible to fit on your regular laptop. We have the most accurate mean absolute error, mean squared error two, um, and we still have the correct coverage, which means our uncertainty quantification estimation of all those parameters is correct, at least um, in, in practice. This is quite a result and we're very, very excited, especially since our computing, so these timings are not exactly one-to-one -one since our hardware was not exactly the same as theirs, but theirs was much more powerful than ours. So uh, we're quite excited. Okay, so now I want to tell you just really quickly, I don't want to belabor this, but I want you to be able to fit this with your own data. Um, so this MyGPies data is released, um, so I don't want you to get confused. The that Python package is called MyGPies, and that's just a, a funny uh, twist on MyGPs. So the, the MyGPies is the Python package, MyGPs is the method itself. They're, they're different, but they're the same. Okay, so uh, the two uh, functions you really need to set before you do your real call to this 
Um, first, you need to set up your nearest neighbor call um, and you're just giving it keywords. And so here, uh, HNSW is uh, an approximate nearest neighbor algorithm. You can also use an exact nearest neighbor algorithm with this. Um, and then you'd like to set up your kernel and parameters for your kernel. Um, I would recommend using the matern kernel and then the uh, L2 norm is just the, the uh, a traditional district distance metric and the F2 is just that squared, which would be appropriate for something like an RBF. Um, so then you would like to set what parameters you want to fix. And when you're first trying this, I would recommend fixing epsilon and your length scale. The reason being those are very unsensitive in terms of your predictions. So when you're first playing with those, so that is definitely not necessary. And if you uh, if you're letting your epsilon go, uh, it could cause major computational things in the, the the method, and it might not work nearly as well. Okay, so basically what I'm telling it here by this last line in the top is that I want it to estimate the newer new uh, variable, which is the most important ones, and I gave it some bounds. I want it to be relatively unsmooth. So between 0.1 and 0.5 is a lot less smooth. Okay, and then the re the way that you would actually call this is via this function here at the bottom. So it's called do regress, and the way that I have it structured here, it's going to give you back uh, uh, um, both your predictions and your prediction variances. Okay, so um, you'll put in just your testing, your training, training Y data, uh, you'll pick your number of nearest neighbors. I would not suggest anything less than 50. Uh, your batch size, something like 1,000 or 2,000 is very good. Loss method, mean squared error is fine for now. The variance method can either be diagonal or none. The reason that we have it like this, typically your covariance for your predictions would be a full dense matrix. But when you ask for a lot of prediction locations, uh, you do not have the storage to return that. So just diagonal will give you something you can create your confidence intervals with um, and reverse either true or false and the things that we set up to begin with. Um, very easy. Uh, I would be happy to, to get you set up and you can just call this directly. Uh, for, you can pip install uh, MyGPies now for open source. Okay, so finally in the last time here, I wanna talk about the application that actually got us excited about this and what led us to this problem, and that is the idea of sky surveys. So we're living in the heyday of this astronomical data. It's very exciting. We're starting to learn and hopefully learn more about dark matter and things about our universe. Um, so basically what these surveys are, like LSST, the Hyper Supreme uh, um, Cam, things, sky surveys like this, they take very large and deep pictures of the universe, and we have to parse that data which is very expensive to do, uh, at least computationally expensive, uh, both because there's a large number of objects in the sky that we're trying to identify, but also because uh, each object that each thing we're trying to identify is a picture, which is already a high dimensional object. Um, Okay, so the general idea here, and this might be uh, familiar to you, because actually this problem is what inspired the DSI uh, students problem this year. They had the same data, um, is that there are stars and galaxies that we're trying to distinguish between. We're trying to perform this classification problem. And so in addition to an image, so each object has uh, essentially eight images associated with it. Um, four of them are what we call point spread functions, which basically help us know about the, the, the flux sort of that we're seeing around it. So uh, if, if it's perfectly symmetrical, we know to expect something perfectly symmetrical in the image. If it's distorted a little bit, we will know to expect that sort of distortion. Okay, that's a way oversimplification, but I'm running out of time. And so we'll also get these at each for, for several frequency domains. So we have this, this cube of data, if you will, eight images for each object. And some of these, so I think I'm showing you examples of stars and galaxies. Some of them are very obvious. You can see with your eyes which one is which, but uh, if I just cover up what the, the uh, what they are, um, I definitely the second row, it looks more like the original, the other class 
for these examples that I showed. Uh, so it's not so easy to do via via just just without testing. You need some sort of classifier for this. Okay, and this is just showing this again. Uh, this is a TSNE projected version of this data. The point is just that there's no separation. If there was a nice line I could draw between these, this would be a nice easy problem, which it's not. Okay, so image data is a little bit harder than the type of data we've been talking about because each pixel itself would be its own variable. Now, as the number of di the dimension increases with a Gaussian process, Actually, this bad thing happens where, as that happens, the uh, the the creaking weights will tend towards zero, and that's because you're as you're increasing your dimension, you're increasing the distance, you're sparsifying the different the distance between each observation. So instead of being very close to something in one dimension, if it's far away in the other dimensions, the full distance is very very far away. Okay, so basically, uh, what, this isn't important, but the point I'd like to make is it's not ideal to do this directly on the pixels because it will just give you back whatever you put in as your mean predictor. So instead, we're going to do a PCA reduction prior to fitting it in. And this type of data, is particularly this data set, is a really good candidate for this because the data is very Gaussian. Um, so we have a, a very small number of PCA components that tend to fit the shapes of these stars and galaxies very, very well. As you can see, we start out with our low frequency uh, PACA co components that are more just like the, the circle, the star. And as we get to more uh, components, we get more complex exterior, potentially galaxy-like features. Okay, so the first data example that we ran on this data was, was do we need all these images in order to fit this? Um, or can we just use information from one of the bands? And actually, we found that information from the I band only contained the best prediction, uh, although this was not statistically significantly different from either using Z or using uh, the, uh, all of the data. One could just use all of the data, but we, we opted for the smaller uh, just the I band and actually the astronomers told us that this made a lot of sense since this was the the band that uh, the best prediction or the best collection of the data was uh, was prioritized. They knew that this band would work the best. Um, we also see here that the point spread functions, including them actually does very much help with the classification. Okay, so here's our big example, our, our big sort of finale here from this data set. Um, and this is that uh, in very, very small data here, we're seeing that the Gaussian process, even with my GPIs, where there can be some problems in small data, we're seeing a, a large gap in performance improvement by using a Gaussian process. Um, and then at the large data set, you might see a tiny, tiny mean gap, but it's not statistically significantly different among the methods that we tried. Um, but the big difference we saw here was in the large data was the difference in computing time. And so our scaling of our data um, in our early MyGPies uh, um, prototype was much improved over that of a, of a typical CNN fit in a simple, a simple way with a Myrtle architecture. Um, uh, the thing that I am most impressed by here is our scaling. So the, the log sample size here is on the bottom and we've gotten to very, very large sample sizes here and we're still very much under a minute. Um, and our scaling definitely even beats uh, linear scaling in this observation case, which is extremely impressive and could open the door in the future to much more advanced uh, features of this type of modeling. Okay, so this is sort of an unfair comparison, but I'm going to show it anyway. So the same example uh, in a fixed computing number of computing time. So instead of, instead of letting the algorithms finish, we're going to give them X amount of time and see how, how well they can perform Clearly, because the CNN takes much, much longer to converge, it does a lot, lot less well in this comparison as opposed to the GP. So if you're in a limited 
uh, if you're trying to just test things out at the beginning of your process, if you're trying to work in edge computing, these sort of things, something very in inexpensive like MindGPIs might be the way to go. I'm not going to do this because I don't have very much time. Okay, the the this is me showing the uncertainty quantification. So let's just look at this first example where I was optimizing. So remember, alpha is the type one error, and one minus beta is the type two error. So that's making those mistakes. Let's say I equally think making both those mistakes is bad. Um, so for different sub sample sizes of training in this data, uh, we would identify about five of these images as being ambiguous that we could test. And actually, uh, based on the classification accuracy of those images, it's much, much worse than the classification accuracy of those that we classified. So clearly we're doing a very, very good job. Okay, so the question is, where do we go next from here? I do want to note that the model that we've shown you is entirely stationary. Unless you put a mean into it beforehand, the, the, the model that you're fitting is a stationary Gaussian process, which can be good, especially when you have small data. But basically what that assumption means is that your distance is the only thing that uh, determines the correlation between things. And that distance is the same in every variable and in every place across each variable. We have shown this is our this is our star galaxy data. These were the hard to predict ones that I left uh, that I put in. Um, let's say that these are the stars. Um, so the whether it's purple or white is the classification, and based on whether I gave it a non-smooth parameter or a smooth parameter. Um, Clearly, they come to opposite conclusions in these two cases, and because they're all of one classification, one would be better for one case and another would be better for another case. So basically, what I'm seeing here is a classic example of a spatially varying parameter fitting better. Um, so we do not have the opportunity to do this yet. Um, and there are actually many ways that data can be non-stationary. I just want to point out that smooth data does not necessarily mean that it is stationary. If in some regions it's moving faster and in other regions it's moving less fast, that's probably a non-stationary data. Um, I, and basically what we're planning to do, we're still fingers crossed, um, we're, we're trying to push this data forward into the form of an ER LDRD proposal that would further this MyGPI's data, um, both to the, this more flexible non-stationary case, but also to an HPC implementation that would be particularly great for people at Livermore to think LBAN, but for MyGPI's. Um, so our current MyG, our current MyGPI's does not currently have these features yet, but fingers crossed we'll be able to implement this in the next couple of years. Um, here we have a lot of papers out already on archive using this and please download the, the data. Email me if you have any problems. I'm happy to help you. Our team is happy to help you get set up on this. Um, and thank you so much for listening. Thanks so much, Amanda. That looks like some really interesting work and we're getting some applause already. Um, and also, in addition to being it being interesting, it's also very accessible since you have the new package out, uh, which is very exciting. Thank um, you. And it's open source, so you can share it with your collaborators, too. Awesome. So it's been approved to be released to any external audience. Yes, it has. It's an MIT license. Perfect. Um, so we do have a couple of questions and a lot of discussion. Um, in the, the chat, um, some of it was related to people discussing what might be the answer to some of these questions. I want to give you a stab at them. So mm -hmm. do you want to pull the chat open or do you want me to read them? Yeah, I have it. OK, so the first two are from Robert Blake, and I think the rest of it is primarily discussion of those. I'll let you know if anything else pops up at the bottom, but go ahead oh. and take a stab at those two. OK, so the first question asks what happens at the boundary between two prediction regions? So do you get discontinuity? So I want to be clear, this is not like a local model. So that's actually the type of modeling that I did in my PhD, where you divide up the domain and you fit an independent model to each of these. This is not like this. This is just the predictions that are that are local. And there is and for that reason, there is no no discontinuity effect. There's no problem. So even if you were to look at this, 
if there is is some of that error, um, it will be smoothly varying across your domain. Um, so that local error that I was showing you, uh, it, there will be no none of that in this model. Um, does the dimensionality of the data matter? What if you have 100 dimensional data? What if you need more than do you need more than 100 points? Okay, so you definitely need more than 100 points. Uh, to use my, my GPIs, uh, to reiterate, I'm sure this was earlier in the talk, um, I, I would not use this. I, there's no reason to not use a typical GP if you have anything smaller than, say, 1,000. Um, uh, and 100 dimensional data, you could probably get away with. Like our, So our image classification problem, we, we took things that were uh, of size. The PCA components was about 50 dimensions, and that worked just fine. But uh, the, like I showed you, if the dimension gets too, too large, you, you will have a problem. And I'm not seeing any other uh, questions pop up. A um, couple of uh, thanks for the talk. Great job, which, you know, more thumbs up. Um, Great. Thank you all. And I guess we are, oh, wait. Practical question. We have one more from Rob. Okay. How do you recommend transforming zero to infinity or negative infinity to infinity data, the input training data? Okay, so that, to be clear, I don't mean that the Ys have to be between that data. It has, it's the Xs that need to be between them. I would still scale my, my Ys by, by the, the, the variance. So maybe they're variance one or something, just, just so they're not way outside the realm of things that it would be predicting. They're, typically, that wouldn't make a difference. Uh, that's just good practice. But um, your domain, so your training data, will typically have a range, even if it's going to be between negative infinity and infinity in general, you'll have some set of that, right? So that would be how I would normalize it to that range is based on the values that you actually have. And that's not like a hard and fast rule. It's just that the, the reason it, this for the normalization, just to let you know, is just because the parameter values that it will expect are are between a reasonable range for that for that normalization of data. Clearly, if your data range is instead of zero to one, it's two million. Uh, the parameter estimates that we are going to be testing over won't be the same. Um, and just to to normalize that, that's that's why we made that decision. Uh, if you put between zero and one point two, it will not break the sky. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I think since we're just a little bit over time, we can go ahead and wrap it up here. But the great news is that Amanda is one of our own. So if you would love to reach out with her and have a chat about this, she is definitely available and you can always set up a WebEx meeting or send her an email. Thank you. Always happy to talk about this and excited to get in the hands of more people. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in and next month I'll be handing the reins over to Sarah and we will keep going with this wonderful seminar and thanks again amanda thank you thank you for inviting me all right bye everyone bye